Good afternoon, good morning, even, just about, uh, and welcome to HTTP Desync Attacks, smashing into the cell next door. Have you ever seen a system that was so complex, it just had to be vulnerable? These days, we rely on layer upon layer of abstraction to have the faintest understanding of what's really happening with a website. And we tell people things like, HTTP is stateless, and you send one request, you get one response. But what if both of those were just kind of wrong? In this session, I'll share with you new tools and techniques to desynchronize complex systems, smash through the barriers around HTTP requests, and make websites rain exploits on their visitors. During some research last year, I came up with a theory, which was, if you're trying to select a topic to research, then the best topic is the one that makes you personally the most nervous. And this year, I thought, okay, I'm going to try this theory out. So I asked myself, what topic am I really scared of? And the answer for me was HTTP request smuggling. I saw a talk on this a few years ago at DEF CON called Hiding Wookiees in HTTP. And it was a thrilling presentation, but it left me far too nervous to tackle that topic myself for a number of reasons. One of them is that this technique was first documented way back in 2005, and yet I'd never seen it successfully used on a real website. Another issue was that some of the diagrams made absolutely no sense to me because my technical understanding at such low-level HTTP stuff was not up to scratch. And then also, there were some really worrying statements on some of the slides. One of them said, you will not earn bounties using this research. And another, even worse, said, you will certainly not be considered like a white hat if you even test to see if any live websites are vulnerable. Because this technique can have such catastrophic consequences. So at the time, I thought, okay, I'm just going to leave this well alone. But this year, I thought, I'll just try this out and see what happens. And, well, quite a few things happened. Uh, I did manage to earn some bounties, and no one's called me a black hat for it so far, although after I first gave this talk on Twitter, someone did call me a terrorist. <laughs> uh, but I did get quite a few interesting reactions. A number of people were surprised, but one guy was so surprised with the vulnerability that I found in his site that he seemed to think I was faking the entire thing, that I was doing some kind of digital sleight of hand in order to trick him into paying me a bounty. And at the other end of the spectrum, a different guy liked the unique technique that I used on his company's website so much he thought he would take that technique for himself and try and earn himself some bounties using this technique behind my back. And uh, of course I had no idea he was doing this, he didn't tell me or ask me or anything, until uh, he ran into some technical issues with it because it wasn't the easiest technique in the world. <laughs> and decided the best way to solve these issues was to pretend to be someone else and email me and ask for help, <laughs> uh, which didn't work out very well for him. Uh, but anyway, out of all of this chaos, I've been able to bring you safe detection methods which with, with which you can find this vulnerability with no chance of being called a black hat, all new methods to trigger desynchronization and exploit the results, and methodology and tooling to bring clarity to a topic that's been overlooked for far too long. So, first I'm going to talk about what makes this attack possible, how to assess if a target is vulnerable, and what to do next. After that, we'll look at how to exploit it with a load of case studies, all looking at real websites, starting out with some really simple, easy ones, building in complexity, and ending with a live demo in which I'll also show how to use the open source tool that I'm releasing to accompany this research. After that, I'm going to talk about defense, uh, and then I probably won't have time to answer questions with everyone, but if you come and speak to me at the back, I'll answer them then. So, if you picture a website as an end user, it will probably look something like this, because as an end user, that's all that we can directly see. But behind the scenes, most websites are routing requests through a chain of servers, speaking to each other using HTTP, which is sent over a stream-based transport layer protocol like TCP or TLS. And for the sake of performance, these streams in between the front-end and back-end server are heavily reused following the HTTP 1.1 Keep Alive protocol. And that means the HTTP requests are placed back to back on these streams with no delimiters in between them. And each server in the chain 
is expected to parse the HTTP headers to find out how long the message is, which tells it where that message stops and where the next one starts. So we've got requests from users from all over the world being funneled through these tiny pools of TCP and TLS streams, and then servers are having to do parsing to work out where the individual requests are within these streams. What could possibly go wrong? Well, what happens if, as an attacker, we send an ambiguous message, one that gets parsed as being a different length by the front end and the back end server? So here, we, we've sent one request, shown in blue and orange, and the front end thinks this is one request. So it sends the whole thing onto the back end, and when the back end is reassembling it, for some reason, it thinks the second blue square is the end of that request. So it thinks the orange square is the start of the next request. And then it will wait for this phantom second request to be completed until the next real request gets sent down that stream, maybe by the attacker or maybe by someone else. And then effectively that orange bit of data just gets stuck on the start of the next request to hit the back end. So using request smuggling, we can apply an arbitrary prefix to the next request to hit the back end server. That's, that's the essence of request smuggling. And because we can't directly see what's happening behind the front end server, it's really easy to get confused and bogged down in technical details. I certainly did myself for several months, uh, but ultimately it's really that simple. Now let's zoom in and see what the data looks like on the wire. <coughs> this request is ambiguous because we're using an absolutely classic desynchronization technique. We've simply specified the content length header twice. And in this example, the front end is looking at the first content length header, so it's forwarding all the blue data and the orange G onto the back end. The back end looks at the second content length header, so it reads off all the blue data, and it thinks the G is the start of the next request. So when the next request arrives, it just gets this G at the start, and whoever that is, is probably going to get a response saying something like, unknown method G post. And that's it. We've successfully done a request smuggling attack. The only catch is this technique is so classic that it doesn't really work on anything that's actually worth hacking these days. What does work on plenty of interesting systems is using chunked encoding. So chunked encoding is an alternative way of specifying the length of a message, whereby instead of specifying it up front, you just send transfer encoding chunked, and then the server will pass the body of the message more or less until it reaches a zero followed by an empty line. So in this example attack here, it's basically exactly the same as the previous example. The front end has looked at the content length. It's forwarded the blue data and the orange G, and the back end has treated this message as being chunked. So they've stopped parsing that message after the zero and the empty line. And once again, we inflict a G post response on someone else who happens to be browsing the website at the time. Now, what if the desynchronization happens the other way around? So in this example, the front end is treating this message as being chunked, and the back end is looking at the content length. Well, as you can see, we can still exploit this. Uh, you just need to change what the payload looks like slightly, and we've got this small limitation in, in the, the malicious prefix shown in, shown in orange on every slide throughout this presentation has to end in a zero followed by an empty line. Uh, but in general, that's not going to cause us any problems. Now, if you're looking at the content length header, you might be wondering why it's three when there's only one visible date, uh, byte of data shown in blue. Uh, that's because just bear in mind, every line ends with slash r slash n. Uh, but in general, I recommend using the, using the colors rather than the numbers in the slides. Uh, I probably got some of the numbers wrong anyway. So why does that chunk technique work on so many systems? Well. I think we've got to give some credit to the specification. The original spec, RFC 2616, says if you're a server and you receive a message that uses a content length and chunked encoding, you should prioritize chunked encoding. It doesn't say you should normalize this message or, you could, or, or that you should reject this message. So it's implicitly taken as saying these requests are acceptable and should be processed. And chunked encoding is kind of complex. So some servers simply don't support it. Uh, so all you need to be able to exploit a given target is one, one server in the chain that doesn't support chunked encoding, and you can desynchronize it and hack it. And this technique by itself worked on pretty much every single server using the content delivery network. 
Akamai, uh, which was a lot of servers. Uh, they patched that roughly f 48 hours after I first gave this presentation. <laughs> so, yeah, that technique works on loads of stuff by itself, but obviously we don't want to be limited to just using that. Uh, we want to hack some, some systems where all the servers in the chain do support transfer encoding, and the good news is you often can. All you have to do is find a way to hide the transfer encoding header from one server in the, in the chain and thereby trick it into falling back to using the content length. One way of doing this is by sticking some white space before the colon in the, in the header name. If you're using Golang for your server and you didn't release the patch that came out yesterday, uh, then that technique will work on your server. And other servers grep the transfer encoding header for the word chunked instead of tokenizing it. So they will think that that message is chunked and you can desynchronize them. And there's loads of techniques that you can use to desynchronize systems. Uh, this is just a sampling of them, but every, te every technique shown on this slide is one I've successfully used to exploit a real system that had a bug bounty program. Uh, and the ones highlighted in orange are those that I came up with join this research myself, so I don't think they've ever been documented elsewhere and used for request smuggling. Now, these are the techniques that I, that I presented when I first gave this technique, gave this presentation at Black Hat one month ago. So, some of the systems you could hack with these have been found and patched, uh, and I, I want to keep things interesting for you guys. So, I've spent the last couple of weeks exploring some new techniques, and I'm going to, which have never been publicly released, uh, so here they are. Now, over the years, quite a few people have put quite a lot of effort into bypassing web application firewalls using malformed headers. And it turns out what you're doing there is basically de is using a desynchronization attack. It's just that you're using it to merely bypass a WAF uh, rather than cause absolute chaos that we'll, that we'll be seeing later. So I've taken these techniques and I've reapplied some of them uh, and tested them out, and here we're going to get three techniques that I've successfully used in the last week to exploit real systems. This first one's crazy. Some systems are really lazy. They don't look for the word chunked. They just look for CHU. <laughs> uh, so using that, they will, they will treat that message as chunked. Other servers won't, and you can desynchronize them. As ever, null bytes come in useful when you're trying to hack stuff. Uh, some, some servers will treat that message as being chunked and a decent amount won't. Uh, and my favorite technique is a little bit more subtle. If you, if you remember in HTTP, uh, line ending headers are supposed to end with slash r slash n. But generally most of the time you can end them just using slash n. So there's this kind of vagueness and ambiguity there. And what I found is some servers let you end headers with slash r, slash n, slash r. And that extra slash r means that other servers don't notice that header and think it's part of the previous header or something, or just treat the whole value as being in, uh, invalid and you can desynchronize it. And using that technique, I was able to exploit uh, some extremely well-known systems that haven't patched yet, so I can't name them, uh, but you would definitely know if I did name them. Uh, also, a word of warning, this technique, if you scan, also flags on the whole of Google's infrastructure. Uh, as far as I can tell, that's not exploitable, uh, but feel free to have a look and prove me wrong. Okay, so now we understand the fundamentals of how to desynchronize servers. So we've got this really powerful building block. But if we just try and whack a server with this building block, I can tell you with confidence you'll run into hazards and complications and waste a lot of time. So to avoid that, I've developed this methodology to guide us in a controlled manner, step by step, towards a successful exploit. First off, we need to detect when desynchronization is possible. Now, there's a really obvious way of doing this, which is to send two requests to the server, where the first one is designed to desynchronize it and poison the backend socket, and the second request is just a normal one that's designed to get poisoned by the first one. But this approach comes with a massive catch, which is that if anyone else's request hits that backend in between our first and second requests, they'll get the poisoned response, they'll potentially have a bad day, and we won't find the vulnerability, we'll get a false negative. So we need a better way of finding this vulnerability. And I think I've got one here. So 
how this serve, how this request gets processed depends on whether the front end and the back end use the treat it as being chunked or use the content length. If both the front end and the back end look at the content length header, that's fine. The, the blue to date, the blue data will get forwarded and responded to, and will get a fairly normal response immediately. If the front end system looks at the transfer encoding chunked header, uh, then it will try and parse this message messages being chunked. It will, it will read in the three. It will read in the A, B, C, and then it will read it in the next chunk size, which is Q. Q is not a valid chunk size, so it will just reject this message outright, and it generally won't get forwarded onto the back-end server. But if the front-end looks at the content length header and thereby forwards the blue data but not the Q, then th and the back-end treats the message as being chunked, then it will time out while waiting for the next chunk size to arrive. So if you send that request and you get a timeout, that's a decent indication that that server is vulnerable to request smuggling. And we can use a very similar t technique to identify when servers are, are vulnerable the other way around. This technique should be tried on every endpoint on a target website because websites may be routing different URLs to different backend systems. So you, you may find only some of those endpoints are vulnerable. I've, uh, the open source tool that I'm Releasing and Core Burp Suite Scanner both use this technique to find this vulnerability for you, so you should never be needing to actually try that manually. The real strength of this technique is that although because it's inference based, it will get some false positives, it doesn't get many and it gets vastly less false negatives. For example, on one real target, this, this approach said it was vulnerable every time I scanned it, whereas trying the request pair technique took me 800 failed attempts before I demonstrated that it was, in fact, exploitable. Now, sometimes you can just stop there and report that, but most of the time, clients are not going to take a report seriously without a bit more evidence, so that's when we're going to start using this, this request pair technique that's kind of hazardous and is why you might theoretically get called a black hat. Uh, so here, the first request, shown in orange and blue, is designed to poison the backend server with the data in orange, and then we're going to send a second one. And the idea is the second request, shown in green, is one that would not, not normally get a, a 404 back. So if we send that and we do get a 404, it shows that the poison actually worked. Now, there's a few things we need to bear in mind when trying this technique. One is that it's really important that you don't send those two requests, uh, the, the attack and the victim request, over the same connection yourself. I don't use Keep Alive, because if you do that, you'll just get false positives. Also, the endpoint that you send the blue and orange request to is really, really important. If a server isn't expecting to receive a post request to that endpoint, it might, uh, it might respond with a 400 or 500 code, and when servers do that, they often close the connection to the front end, and that will mean that the orange data is effectively thrown out and the attack will fail. Also, even if you go to all of those lengths, this technique is going to be non-deterministic, even on websites that have no other users. So, at this point, we've covered the theory of detecting this vulnerability, how it works, and ha how to confirm if a server is really vulnerable. Now we're finally going to take a look at what damage we can do. So as I mentioned, uh, these are all real systems, although I've had I've have to redact quite a few. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out to the companies that actually let me name them. Please remember, these are the guys that are now secure against these techniques. Uh, also, as usual, during this section, I'm going to keep a running total of the bounties earned during this research. Uh, of those, I get 0%. 50% uh, get spent on beer by, uh, by my company, uh, and the other 50% goes to local charities. Now, Probably the easiest attack that you can do with request smuggling is simply bypassing security rules that have been implemented on the front end system. For example, a well-known software vendor has their front end set up to block access to slash admin. But using request smuggling, we can really easily bypass that because the front end thinks that orange bit of data is just the body of the first request. So if we send a follow up ourselves, that's that follow up from the front end's point of view is trying to access slash but we actually get access to the admin page. So far, so simple. Now, lots of front ends like to rewrite requests by adding headers to them. And one header that practically 
every system uses some variation of is X forwarded for, which simply specifies the remote user's IP. And on well-configured systems, we can't spoof our, our IP with this header, because if we specify it, the front end will, will, will just rewrite or remove it. But by putting that header in the smuggled body, uh, we can hide that header from the front end and bypass this rewrite and therefore make it look like we're coming from any, uh, from any IP address out there. And using that technique on a security vendor on their store, uh, I got an incredible $300 bounty. <laughs> so I'm not saying you're going to get rich quick using that technique, but it's, it is worth knowing it may come in useful sometimes. And also, there's a slightly less obvious use for it, which is, imagine you have a target where the timeout technique suggests it's vulnerable. But the target gets a really high traffic, traffic volume, right? So the request pair technique never works because you keep on just poisoning someone else's request. What you've got there is effectively a blind request smuggling vulnerability. How can you prove that that's really vulnerable? Well, one way is to take a header like this and put a unique host name in there. If you send that and you get a DNS lookup for that host name, that proves that that data which is in the body of the request has been interpreted as a separate request by the backend system and thereby proves that it's vulnerable. Now, yeah, IP spoofing is okay, but the really interesting behavior is going to tend to come from custom application-specific headers. And to make use of those, uh, we need to know what they are. Fortunately, it's generally pretty easy to find out, as long as the application has one endpoint which expects to receive a post request and reflects one parameter. So here I'm targeting New Relic, and I've smuggled a request that's trying to sign in, and I've made it so my email address is the last parameter. And that means when I send the follow-up, that request gets concatenated onto the email address that I'm trying to log in with, and the response to that second message comes, c comes back and it pre-fills my email address, which contains uh, the whole of the second request, after it's been rewritten by the front-end server, thereby disclosing all the headers that the front-end server uses. So we're going to use some of those shortly. Now, on New Relic, their backend was, an inter was a, a reverse proxy itself, like they had a chain of quite a few servers. So by changing the host header that I smuggled, I could get access to different internal-only systems. But they all just came back with this redirect to HTTPS because they thought my message, because my message was being downgraded to HTTP by the front end. But by looking at the headers they were using, I saw they were using x proto HTTPS, so I just stuck that on there and actually got access to these internal systems. And I went hunting for interesting information, and I found this endpoint that gave a really teasing error message. It said, not authorized with header. And then there was a colon, and then that was it. That was the whole response, and it did not tell me what header I needed to authorize myself. So I, I, uh, I looked back at what headers the front end was using on the login page and saw this XML and our external service header and tried that, and it didn't work at all. It actually made the problem worse. Uh, so at this point, what I could have done, uh, the proper way of doing this, would have been to reuse that request reflection technique on lo loads of different New Relic endpoints until I found the name of this header. But I was feeling kind of lazy, uh, so instead I cheated and I consulted my notes from last time I compromised New Relic. <laughs> and that included the service gateway account ID and service gateway is New Relic admin headers. Uh, so by specifying those on a smuggled uh, request, uh, I could gain access to their core internal API as an arbitrary account, as an admin, and had basically full control over everything. Uh, and I got a decent $3,000 bounty for that. So, oh yeah, and also they traced the root cause of this to their F5 uh, Big IP front end. Uh, Big IP responded a few weeks later by publishing an advisory. Please note, this is just an advisory, it's not a patch. So you really need to read it uh, and apply the fixes that they say you could do inside it. Uh, so what we've seen here is sometimes with request smuggling, if you're willing to put some time in, you can break directly into internal systems uh, and have a great time. But there's also much easier techniques focused on exploiting other users. In particular, if the application has any way of storing text data persistently, then exploitation is really easy.
So here I'm on Trello, which is a well-known note-taking application, and I'm just, and I'm smuggling a request that says I'd like to update my public profile page, and I've made it so the profile data, which is just a text field, uh, is the last parameter. So I'm going to send that, and then I didn't send any follow-up myself. So someone else's request got concan got concatenated onto my profile, and then I could just browse to my own profile and see the whole of their request, including all their session cookies and session headers and so on, regardless of whether they're HTTP only or secure or whatever, and just hijack their account really easily. Uh, and every time I sent that, I just got access to a random different person's session with no user interaction. Uh, there's one small catch with this thing. Uh, with this technique. So the, as soon as I saw this, I was like, great, I can use this and hijack login requests and get passwords. That'd be amazing. Uh, unfortunately, this technique will only let you steal data up to the first ampersand in the victim's request. So you typically can't steal post messages or you, you, you can't steal the data in post messages. Uh, but there is an exception. If the login system uses JSON, then you can, as long as the victim's password uh, doesn't contain an ampersand. <laughs> and yeah, uh, I also uh, exploited a different site using that where the text storage, there was no obvious way of storing text data and getting the response, but I was able to concatenate the victim's request onto a support ticket, and eventually I would then get an e email uh, containing the victim's request and session cookies and so on. Now, what if you can't store data? Well, <laughs> there's a whole nother branch of attack that we can do based on serving up harmful responses to other people on the site. Now, this example uh, kind of sucks, but it's great for sharing the concept. So on this site, a well-known SaaS vendor, they had a reflected cross-site scripting vulnerability. And by itself, you know, that's okay, uh, but it's not that great because it requires some kind of user interaction to exploit it. They've got to click a link, I send them, or something like that. Uh, so it's not suitable for mass exploitation. But by smuggling the request that triggered that payload and then not sending a follow-up, then regardless of what the request someone else was sending, they would get the response containing my payload and get exploited. Uh, and that would once again expose HTTP only cookies and the like. Uh, but the key thing is here, this is just exploiting a random person browsing the website with no user interaction. So I can send that over and over and just hijack everyone's accounts. Uh, the other thing worth mentioning here is that this technique can be used with traditionally unexploitable XSS, like XSS in the, in the user agent header and XSS in post requests that have CSERF tokens and so on. Right, now, uh, this is when things stopped going according to plan. Uh, while testing one target, I was trying to trigger a redirect, uh, and for some reason, I don't normally do this, uh, I happened to load the home page in a browser with the developer tools open, and I got this error message. Uh, and I recognized the IP address in this error message. That's the Burp Collaborator server, uh, which you don't want appearing on someone else's home page. Uh, and what was concerning was I saw that error message regardless of what device and what network I loaded their homepage from. Uh, and kind of trawling back through what payloads I've been sending, uh, I had sent something like this to try and trigger a redirect and evidently what had happened was someone else's request had snuck in after mine and they'd been trying to fetch an image. Now by itself, you know, they tried to fetch an image, they got a redirect, whatever, it's only one person. But they had a cache, like the server had a server-side cache, and it had seen this happen. So it saw this person trying to fetch this image and getting a redirect to the collaborator server. Uh, by the way, this image was on the target's homepage, uh, and thereby it just saved that. So from then on, for several days, uh, anyone that loaded that website's homepage ended up trying to fetch this image from the, c c from the collaborator server. Uh, and unfortunately, because it was HTTPS and an IP, it just failed, so I couldn't find out what the image was meant to be and then host it on my own server so that their website wasn't so broken. Uh, so what we've seen here, on the one hand, cache poisoning with request smuggling is really easy. It's so easy, you can do it by accident. But on the other hand, uh, you don't want this to happen by accident, <laughs> seriously. Uh, so there's a few things we can do to try and reduce the chance of that happening. Uh, one is to try and craft our prefix so that it triggers a response that has anti-caching headers. 
And other is to, if your victim request is a get, make sure you put a cache buster on it. Uh, and also try and send those, send those requests as fast as possible, uh, which the tool that I've released will help with. And finally, if you have a choice of which front end to exploit, for example, because the target is using a CDN, try, just try and target one in a geographic region that's asleep because they'll be getting less traffic. Now, that was bad, uh, but it left me wondering what happened if in instead of trying to avoid that possibility of cash poisoning with, a, with an attacker's and a victim's request being combined, we embrace it. So here I've sent a request that's trying to fetch an API key. And when the victim's request gets stuck on the end, it's completed using their cookie. So it, it, it's in their session and it fetches their key. And they're going to be the person that sees that, that response. So by itself, that's harmless. But when there's, once there's a cache in the mix, the cache may end up thinking that's actually some static resource and saving it over the static resource. And then you can browse to that JavaScript and just fetch their key. Uh, this is basically web cache deception. Uh, the main difference being that, as usual, it doesn't require any user interaction whatsoever. Uh, I wasn't able to get a real example of this because it's not the right type of thing for my pipeline to find, uh, but I'm pretty sure it's out there. Now, on New Relic, we saw that their backend was an internal proxy. And on some other systems, uh, for a reason I've never been able to figure out, uh, they chain CDNs onto each other. So like one target had, the front end was Akamai and the back end from a desynchronization point of view was Cloudflare. Uh, I couldn't exploit that one, but these guys were chaining Akamai onto Akamai. And the, t the two Akamai servers were configured differently. So by changing the host header, I could serve up content from anything anywhere on the Akamai network on these guys' homepage. Uh, and the front end Akamai was happy to cache that so I could overwrite their homepage more or less permanently with content from pretty much anywhere on the internet. Now, looking at Red Hat's website, uh, they were using Akamai, they were vulnerable, and I was looking for a way to how I could do some damage with this technique. And I found this DOM-based open redirect. And that raised an interesting challenge because with request smuggling, we control the URL that the backend server thinks the user is trying to access. But we don't control the URL in the victim's browser. So you can't, you can't hijack the value that gets passed to this get query pram function and exploit this vulnerability. But I was able to find a client, a non, I was able to find a local redirect, a server side local redirect on the target and use that to gain control of the, of the URL in the victim's browser and then send them to the page with a DOM-based open redirect to make that exploitable. So this is a generic t technique that will help you make many DOM-based issues exploitable with request smuggling. Right. So we've seen local redirects can be useful when you've got DOM-based XSS and such like, but they also often just happen to turn into open redirects in the presence of request smuggling because we can control the host header. In particular, there's a default behavior on Apache and some versions of IIS whereby if you try and access a folder without a trailing slash, they just give you a redirect to send you to that folder and the host part of that redirect is populated using your smuggled host header. So using this, you can get a redirect to your server from pretty much any website. And this combines really well with cache poisoning, right? Because you can just take a JavaScript file and permanently convert that JavaScript file into a redirect to your malicious JavaScript file. And that technique was uh, so easy and didn't require much effort in terms of actually looking at the website. You just use it as is on every target. So it became my de facto technique to exploit this vulnerability and I got a decent number of bounties using it. Uh, also worth mentioning is if you can get an open redirect like this, but with a 307 status code, uh, that's wonderful news. Because if a browser is doing a post request, like say trying to log someone in with their username and password, and it sees a 307, it's going to resend the username and password in plain text to that new destination. Now, one of the targets that this uh, redirect poisoning technique worked on was PayPal. Uh, so there was a couple of small catches. One is that because there were two host headers in the smuggled request, one coming from me and one coming from the victim, uh, 
they were getting concatenated in the location header, which wasn't great, but I was able to fix that by sticking a question mark at the end of the host header. The other catch is that if you look closely, you'll see the protocol in the location in the redirect is HTTP, which means when we're trying to hijack script, that may get blocked by mixed content protection, but there are ways around that in Safari and Edge and IE, which I don't have time to cover now, but they're covered in my presentation last year on web cache poisoning. So we can poison this JavaScript file with a redirect to our server permanently in those browsers. Where is this JavaScript file used? Why? Well, it's used on PayPal's sign-in page. Unfortunately, there's a little bit of a catch, which is that PayPal's sign-in page also uses CSP, meaning that this redirect will get blocked by the CSP rules. Uh, but PayPal also use, on their sign-in page, they've got an invisible iframe. And this loads on c.paypal.com, and it also loads our poison JavaScript file. And it doesn't have CSP. So that means we can hijack this iframe on uh, this iframe that's being loaded invisibly on the login page. But we can't just read the user's password out the parent page uh, because of the same origin policy and the fact we want c.paypal.com here. Uh, but my colleague Gareth Hayes, who's around here somewhere, uh, found paypal.com slash us slash gifts. This is a static page. It's on paypal.com. Uh, it doesn't use CSP, maybe because it's static. Uh, and it imports our malicious JavaScript file. So we could hijack the iframe on c.paypal.com and then we could redirect this iframe to the slash gifts page and then we could re-hijack that using our malicious JavaScript file again and then read the user's plain text PayPal password off the parent page and send it off to our website. Uh, and for that, I got a $19,000 bounty off PayPal. Now, PayPal fixed this uh, by making the front-end system reject any message that looked like it was chunked. And they said, like, hey, James, do you think this fix is solid? And I spent half a morning poking at it, and I was like, yeah, seems all right to me. Uh, luckily, I always phrase these things carefully. Uh, and a couple of weeks later, I came up with a new desynchronization technique. And I, I didn't think this one was really going to work. So all I'm doing here is I'm using a line wrapped header. So this is valid per the RFC spec. And every server should treat this as being chunked. And every server kind of did treat this as being chunked, uh, except that for some reason, the line wrap made the word chunked invisible to Akamai. So this bypassed the filter meant I could once again po poison the PayPal's login page. And they paid me another 20k bounty. Uh, I thought that was really generous of them, especially given it was kind of my fault that I didn't find the bypass in the first place. Okay, so now we've seen a whole range of different attacks we can do. With request smuggling, I'm going to attempt a live demo. So, let's see. Here, yep, it's up there, great. Uh, I've got a replica, a replica of a real system that may be familiar, uh, generally holds lots of juicy Firefox zero days. Uh, this is a local replica. And so I'm going to take a request to the site. I'm going to right click and click launch smuggle probe. That option is there because of the open source extension I've installed. And you can see there's loads of desync techniques. And I've turned them all off apart from the one that's actually going to work. So if we look at this flow window, we can see the requests that are being sent. Uh, and you can see this technique, this tool is using the timeout technique, uh, you can see it here, that I showed you earlier, and we are in fact getting a timeout. So it's, it's just going to do some, some confirmations and stuff to make sure this target's vulnerable. And now if we look over, oh dear, uh, if, any second now. If we look over here, then in a second it should find the issue. Let me show you why is this desynchronizing it. Uh, it's because of this header here. Uh, this header ends, this is going to be way too small to see, uh, but after bar, this header ends with 0a. It doesn't end with 0d0a. So that means that the front end server uh, hasn't, basically the front end thinks that's one header and it falls back to using the content length. Right, it's found the issue. Excellent. Uh, so if I right click on the issue, we've now got the smuggle attack option. It's going to pop open a turbo intruder window pre filled with a script that you don't need to change anything in this script except the prefix that. Uh, the prefix variable is the is is the malicious prefix as shown in orange on all the slides. So when I press attack, it's going to send the 
and it's going to send the attack and send a whole bunch of victim requests that are identical. And the idea is one of those should get a 404. Let's see what happens. Yep, there we go. Great. So like these requests are all identical, in including this one, but this one got a 404. Uh, why? Because of this bit of smuggled data here. So we now know that this target is vulnerable. Let's see what damage we could do. So on Bugzilla, anyone can register an account. They can file a bug and they can put an attachment on the bug and the attachment can contain HTML but it gets rendered on a sandbox domain. So here we are on bmoweb.vm, that's where the application is. If I load the attachment, we are on bmosandbox.vm so by itself this behavior is harmless. But what I'm going to do is try and take that request to fetch the attachment and then I'm going to use that in the malicious prefix here. Right, there we go. So now when I send that, you can see one of the requests to the server has ended up fetching this attachment, even though it was actually sent to bmoweb.vm. Uh, so now, simply need to comment out the victim request. So now I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to leave the poison light waiting on the socket in the server. And that means as soon as a user clicks pretty much anything, it doesn't matter, they're going to get my payload back. It's on bmoweb.vm and it's supposed to steal the password and it didn't. There you go. <laughs> it autofills normally. Oh well. <laughs> Boom. Uh, so that's an example just showing you how to use the tool. That's the first time that's demoed failed out of like the five times I've done this. Uh, lucky you guys, I guess. Uh, and for that, I got a nine, $8,000 bounty taking the total to just shy of 75k earned so far. Join this research. Now, how do we prevent this? Well, you can't defend against these attacks without tooling to find these vulnerabilities. And in particular, quite a few tools uh, won't let you send invalid content length headers, uh, and they will normalize the requests that you send and both of those things can almost invisibly stop you from finding these vulnerabilities. In particular, curl is not great for sending request smuggling payloads. Uh, please just use like netcat or just pipe e echo to open SSL or something like that that gives you more control over what the request looks like. Also, uh, some companies like to force pen testers to use a proxy or a VPN or something like that. And if that's doing proxying, uh, that will be messing up these payloads, it will be masking real vulnerabilities and it will also be introducing fake vulnerabilities that can only be used to hack other pen testers. So please don't do that. As far as patching this goes, the ideal solution, uh, everyone gets annoyed when I tell them to do this, uh, is to use HTTP2 exclusively to talk to backend servers. Uh, but obviously not everyone can, uh, can do that. So what also works pretty well is having the front end doing extensive normalization of requests uh, before routing them on. Uh, that, te that technique is backed up by RFC 7230. Finally, if you're forced to try and patch this on the back end, uh, you need to, and you get, if you get an ambiguous request, you need to drop that request and also drop the connection ent entirely to ensure any poison data is thrown out. There's a whole bunch of further reading online. The slides are, are online too, uh, available from the top link there. Uh, the main thing I'd like to draw your attention to is the online labs. So we've released a bunch of free online labs that you can use to practice these vulnerabilities on real-ish websites and gain experience with this for yourself before you go out into the real world and everything gets really chaotic. Now, the three key things to take away are that HTTP request smuggling is real, regardless of how much you might not want to think about it. Uh, HTTP 1.1 parsing is a security critical function uh, for functionality. Uh, so when you're making your choice of web server, this is something you should definitely be factoring in. And detection of request smuggling doesn't have to be dangerous. Uh, I'm going to answer questions at the back in just a second. Uh, uh, if you don't get to me, feel free to send me an email. Uh, don't forget to follow me on Twitter and thank you for listening.